Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today is the second part in a two-part series that I've been making on the jobs or the duties of different people in a role-playing game. Last week I looked at game masters and today I will be looking at players. Most of the points that I'm making in this video are derived from Knave Second Edition, which is a role-playing game that I'm developing over on Patreon. However, I think it'll be broadly applicable to most D&D style games, especially if you're running them in a more old school or OSR style. Before we get started though, quick shout out to today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Into the AM and their series of fantasy and sci-fi themed t-shirts. They've been a big long-term supporter of the channel and I really, really like their t-shirts. They haven't shrunk, they haven't faded, still feel fantastic after a whole year. The one I'm wearing right now would work really well if you're running any kind of jungle themed or wildlands themed campaign, like maybe the Dark of Hot Springs Island. Over at their web store, they have some deals going on as well. Like for $60, you can get three t-shirts in a bundle. And if you use my link in the description below, you can get an additional 10% off the whole web store. Thanks again to Into the AM. And now let's get back to the show. All right, the very first job that I think that any player should keep in mind while they are playing a role-playing game is to assist the game master. Role-playing games are very much collaborative games, and the job of the game master is a hard one. There's a lot of pressure put on them to make the game as good as it can be, but that's never going to happen unless players are helping them out. This can be done through all sorts of different ways. For example, showing up on time, uh, bringing snacks, taking notes, making sure that you are paying attention and engaging with the fiction that the game master is putting on the table for you. Draw maps is a really big one too. If you're always asking the game master, where the last location was relative to where you are, that can get really frustrating. They will really appreciate it if they can see that you are tracking your environment and planning out where you're gonna go. If you're a new player, take the time to try and learn the rules. The Game Master will of course help you out and give you plenty of reminders, especially if you're new to this particular system. But in between sessions, get a copy of the rules or just ask the Game Master for one and read them and try and remember the basic structure of how turns work, what your character's abilities are and so on. This will make the game go much more quickly and smoothly. This is especially true in combat. One of the worst things in a role-playing game is when things grind to a halt. In combat, which should be a fast and exciting experience because players don't know when their turn is, and when it does arrive, they have no plan for what they're going to do. Don't let that be you. Plan things out when it's not your turn so that you can move along quickly, do what you're gonna do, and then pass it to the next player as fast as possible. Look at the spells that you have, look at the special abilities you might have, think about what maneuvers or what attacks you're going to do, and then just get that done. You can have your turn over in 10 seconds or less if you know what you're doing and if you plan things out ahead of time. Lastly, a really great way to help out the Game Master in terms of their preparation is at the end of each session, tell them what you are planning to do next session. This will help them focus their uh, prep so that they're only prepping for stuff that's going to be relevant. If you don't tell them what you're going to do and you say, oh, I don't know, I'll just wait to see what the Game Master throws at us, you're telling the Game Master that everything is on them and they're going to have to prep for every possible eventuality. If instead you say, next session, let's head out west where we heard that dungeon was and investigate it. Now the Game Master has a nice, concise, constrained thing to prep for and it'll be much easier on them and more fun for everybody else. The second big job for players in a Dungeons & Dragons-like game is to, of course, play your character. Um, in my head, I break this down into two different parts, fitting in and standing out. When I say fitting in, I mean making a character that makes sense in that particular campaign. You're not trying to make characters that are extremely random and goofy, unless that's the kind of game that you're running, of course. You're trying to make the kind of character that makes sense in that world and that fits with the kind of party that is coming together. It also means avoiding a lot of inter-party backstabbing and infighting, unless that's the kind of campaign that you happen to be in. Most parties of players like uh, a group of PCs that can work well together, that have really great teamwork, that can synergize their different powers and abilities and roles and move through obstacles really quickly. So the other side of fitting in is standing out. You also want your PC to stand out in an interesting way. You wanna give them quirks, something that makes them memorable and interesting so they're not just fighter number two. You really don't have to go overboard on this and create deeply elaborate backstories. Usually just one or two memorable things is all you really need to have them stick in the minds of the game master and in the other players. When it comes to role playing your character, I think it's not that important to get super in depth and get really in character. Some players really love that and that is totally fine. But for me, it's really up to the player. I want the player to find a stance that they feel comfortable with whether that is getting really into the role-playing and doing all the voices or being a little bit more removed and saying, 
my character Boromir moves over there and opens the door. Either one is totally fine. What I don't want to happen is for players to feel pushed into a particular mode of play or a particular mode of playing their character that they don't like. That can really derail things and cause a lot of stress at the table, which is not what I want. The third big job of a player in my mind is confronting the world. And the biggest part of this, I think, is taking initiative. A player that takes initiative is the game master's favorite player. This is the player that doesn't sit there and just wait for the next bit of the plot to come to them. They go out and they look for it. They're actually planning for adventure. They've been taking notes. They've been paying attention to possible seeds, adventures, treasures, magic items that they've heard about. They've looked at the different factions and thought about what those factions are doing in ways that they could be exploited. They have come up with a plan and they're telling the game master what they're going to be doing, not waiting for a plot point. Too often, PCs in a role-playing game act as if they know that they're a protagonist. They act as if, if we just wait here, something cool is bound to happen, guys. And as a game master, that's really frustrating and it makes the game really bogged down. A really big part of taking initiative is asking lots of questions. Back in my Game Master Duties uh, video that I made a week or so ago, I said that Game Masters should be giving players lots of information. And that goes for players too. They should be trying to drag as much information out of the Game Master as they can. They should be interviewing NPCs. They should be searching for clues. They should be visiting sages or going to libraries. As a player, learning a lot about the world gives you that fuel that you need to influence it. It makes you feel much more immersed in the world if you are out there digging for information rather than waiting for it to be handed to you. And it allows the game master to deliver any world building elements that they've come up with at a very uh, realistic and appropriate trickle rather than having to do a big info dump on you all at once, which most players ignore. When it comes to confronting the world, a thing that I love when players do is when they apply tactical infinity. This is when they think outside the box. They don't just look at their character sheet. They don't just look at what special abilities they have as buttons that they can press. Instead, they think of the whole world. They imagine that it's real, and then they do what would be most efficient in that situation. A player that's using tactical infinity is one that realizes that there is no such thing as flavor in a role-playing game. In a role-playing game, you're imagining the whole world is real. So every single element of it could be used to your advantage or could be used against you. A good player is also a schemer. These are the players who love to think way outside the box and end up creating these amazing stories that you tell at your table for years afterwards because they find ways to get stuff done that doesn't use their special abilities, it doesn't use dice rolling, it just uses their understanding of the fictional world and how it can be manipulated to get what they want. In one sense, they are playing it safe and avoiding risk, but really in another sense, they are fitting in with some of the most ancient archetypes of the adventuring hero, like Hercules or Perseus, who's confronted with an impossible obstacle and then overcomes it through sheer brilliance and cunning rather than through hitting it enough times with their axe. Now, the fourth big job for a player in a role-playing game might be a little bit controversial, but for me, it's prepared to die. No one wants their PC to die in a role-playing game, but it's going to happen. It's especially going to happen if you're playing in a more old-school style game like I prefer that has higher lethality, more dangerous monsters, and not particularly balanced encounters. Players who are not genuinely prepared to die, or at least have their PCs die, are going to have a very difficult time because they're not going to treat the world like it's real. When they get into a combat, they're going to assume that it is balanced in their favor, they're going to assume that if they just attack enough times and if they use enough of their resources, they're going to get through okay. This is going to lead to them not being fully immersed in the world and taking the danger of the world seriously. They're also going to be very hurt when their character dies because it'll be so surprising for them. So this is something that I talk to my players about when I'm running games, especially right at the beginning. Death is really on the table here. You have to have uh, an investment in your PC but at the same time, you have to hold them lightly enough that if they die, you're able to let them go. Plus, there are some hidden advantages and benefits to having PCs die. It can allow you to try out new characters. It can allow for amazing, memorable moments that you might not otherwise have had. And it can thrust the party into new and desperate situations that can be just as exciting to try and get out of. Besides, you won't be out of the fight for very long, especially when I run a game. If a PC dies, I have that player create a new character and get back into the fight as soon as possible. I don't wait for the start of the next session. I find some convenient excuse, usually within five minutes, and have them drop right in to help the party. All right, those are my four main jobs or duties of a player in the games that I run. Uh, what do you think? 
Do you agree with me? Do you disagree? Do you have any other jobs you think are vital for players that I missed out on? Uh, if so, leave it down in the comments below and I will check that out. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you want to see more videos like this one. And thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.